Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Boy, that was loud, but I can't hear you. Good morning. Good, 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 good. Good, so uh, welcome to the first Florida International Competition on Technological Innovation. So today we are pleased to have 11 student teams uh, representing 10 Florida universities. Um, and they are going to compete in high tech innovation. Now, they are not going to compete on the football field or the basketball court, but they are going to have to compete in innovation pitches. Uh, so uh, they will try to convince a panel of experts, which I will introduce very soon, okay, a panel of experts in industry and investors that the innovation that they propose can make it to the market and that people can actually buy it and that in some case that this innovation are going to transform our life. Okay, so uh, the winning team will take with them, can you show me this just behind you? It's, it's not yours, but okay, this is the prize, okay, the grand prize, okay. So, uh, good. My name is J.P. Bardet. I am the Dean of Engineering at University of Miami. So a couple of years ago, uh, several Florida uh, engineering deans met and decided to join forces to showcase the talents of our students and their innovations. So our intent was really to feature Florida engineering students to prospective employers. And I think we have some employers here in the room. Uh, if you are an employer, could you be stand up and being recognized? We have Dassault System, Ultimate, and I've seen some other. Okay, well, anyway, so if you're students here, yeah, maybe we have a job waiting for you right here today. Okay. So um, this is also to highlight the fact that Florida is not only a great place for quality of life, but it's also a place to build and invest in high tech. Okay, so Florida is a tech hub, a beach, uh, tech beach, sometimes we say, which compete against Silicon Valley's and the Boston Biotech Corridor. So now, of course, as you know, uh, Florida is home of Emerge America. Emerge America has been launched by Manny Medina a few years ago and his daughter, uh, Melissa, Melissa Medina. So in only a few years, uh, they were able to have Emerge recognized and become bigger than South by Southwest, which is, as you know, in Austin, Texas. So it's really an achievement which demonstrates that Florida is a, has a vibrant innovation ecosystem. Also, I need to make a pitch for a company which is represented here today on the floor. Uh, Florida is home of one of the largest startup ever, okay, Magic Leap. The company was founded by Ronnie Abovitz, an alumni of the University of Miami. Personal, personally, I'm convinced that Magic Leap is going to change our life, okay, and it's going to change the media industry. Uh, so we will be able to watch movies using glasses. I mean, it's going to change the uh, operating theaters. It's going to make a lot of changes. Okay, so it's an honor and a privilege for University of Miami to host and sponsor this inaugural competition. And I, I think I'd like to thank uh, Melissa Medina, uh, president of Emerge America, for our support. Now, I'd like, of course, to recognize a representative of the universities which are sitting in the audience. If you represent uh, a university in Florida, could you please stand up and be recognized? All right, so now it's time to turn to the actual competition and introduce the judges. Um, First, I'd like to introduce Michael, Michael Finney. So don't ask Michael to stand up because Michael has uh, his own crutches. I don't know what he did, but okay. He's the president and CEO of the Miami-Dade Beacon Council. He serves as the official economic development organization for Miami-Dade County. 
So the non-for-profit public-private organization focuses on job creation and economic growth. So as president and CEO, Mike champions the, count the county's efforts to market Miami-Dade as a world-class business destination, grow local companies, and help shape the county economic future. So I've asked Mike to be the head judge of the panel. So Mike, thank you for being here with us. Then we have Jack, Jack Carabiz. Can you stand, Jack? Because I think Jack doesn't have any crutches. So. <laughs> Hi, Jack. So he's the executive president of OXO Technology Labs. He has spent the past 25 years establishing and executing high growth operational plans for early stage and mid-market healthcare software and service community companies. He, is currently, he currently serves as the executive president of OXO Labs, a custom software development. Uh, in his company is, has offices in South Florida, London, Chennai, Hong Kong. Okay, welcome, Jack. Then we have Gary Manheimer. Gary is the founder and chief inv instigator of Mancap Investment LLC. He's a serial entrepreneur, founder, engaged investor, consultant, and instigator in technology, real estate, and emerging industry. He started his first business when he was 12 years old. Wow, all right. And has since been part of both many failed and successful startups. He has a BS in business from the University of Miami. Congratulations. He uh, dropped out from the MBA program to start a digital agency, uh, which was later sold to PwC. Now, let me introduce you, Jimena Zubiria. Jimena. She's a vice president of university with the Venture City, works with startups, founders, and executives. She spent six years in London working at Google and Wildfire, a startup that was ac acquired by Google, uh, and four years in New York working in digital advertising. She started her career in Miami working at an advertising agency while attending Florida International University. So these are our judges, uh, but I have actually uh, a person that I want to bring to the podium who is going to tell you all the rules of the competitions. The man is Bob Williamson. So Bob is an entrepreneur in residence at University of Miami. Bob introduced himself as his third failed retirement as entrepreneur in residence. He has been the founder, founder, director, and uh, most everything else at over 30 startups. He has a BS in engineering and MBA from Stanford University. Bob, you want to take it from here? I'll take it from here. Thank you very much. I just... Hello, we are Guardian Wearables, and as a diverse group of athletes and engineers, we designed an injury detection smart shirt. Every year, about 3.5 million injuries occur from contact sports, and from this, $13.2 billion is spent on these injuries. In order to decrease this price, as well as increase the health of athletes, we designed a shirt that can detect injuries, as well as relay the information back to an athletic trainer. The smart shirt uses uh, pressure sensors that are able to detect and measure the amount of force being exerted as it occurs. Uh, it also features the ability to monitor heart rate and body temperature of the athlete as well. The smart shirt utilizes an innovative design. We create our own 3D printed flexible circuit that's able to conform comfortably to an athlete's body. We also eliminated the use of wires in the shirt by using conductive threading to handle all the connections. The um, shirt is able to send its information wirelessly to a mobile application we developed. This mobile application is able to read the information and display it back to the user in a clear and concise manner that's easy to understand. And one of the ways we did that, as you can see from this image, this red and green circle right here, that indicates that an impact has occurred in that region. The mobile application is also able to give you the time that impact occurred as well as the amount of force of that impact. Currently on the market, there are products such as this sensor sock, which shows pressure placement, but not a high range of impact forces. There's also a Taekwondo vest, which shows a high range of impact forces, but is bulky and not comfortable for the user. So there is no direct competition to us. Athletic trainers are a part of our target market, and they have said our product is an innovation of the future. It is lightweight, comfortable, and safe, and moves with the athlete underneath padding during play. This provides athletes like myself an objective reality check which ultimately reduces re injury recovery time. An example of this would be catching uh, a hairline fracture before it turns into a break. 
This reduces potential time from months to weeks, allowing the athlete to re return quicker to the field. We believe our product is so unique it can enter three different types of markets, sports apparel, smart devices, and sports medicine, which e with each of these markets growing every year. Our product provides three major benefits, the first being real-time injury detection, the second being reduced medical expenses by detecting these injuries earlier, and the third being providing data analytics so that the next generation of athletes can safely participate in contact sports. Other future applications are various smart apparel such as knee sleeves and elbow pads, expanding to other additional sports such as lacrosse, hockey, and soccer, and monitoring military personnel in the field. We are Garden Wearables, and we are the first step in a new generation of safer sports and healthier athletes. I haven't. Thank you. Has a product is a product available for uh, your, your shipping? Your you've got folks out wearing them today. So our main testing has been done with the Florida Tech football team um, and with the athletic trainers there. We worked a lot with the trainers and athletes themselves to make a shirt that's very comfortable for them as well, an app, as well as an app that's best used for an athletic trainer. So right now we don't have anything on the market with like that we sold or anything, but just a lot of testing with the team. So, so is that, that means you have a working prototype or is are you just doing yes. testing? Yeah. The testing actually, the image didn't work properly, but the testing showed the app, how it worked when he got hit, um, and we have tested it, so it's a working prototype. Now you had a football illustration, but obviously there's a lot of other gear that a typical football player would wear. So how does this work under typical football gear? Um, so it still works the same. Uh, basically, uh, it, they would wear it under the shoulder pads, just the impact would be dispersed through the shoulder pads, but the impact point would still reach the vest, still giving a proper readout. Have you guys received any feedback from your prototype and the type of information it's been able to provide to the trainers? So we actually had a couple interviews with athletic trainers um, trying to see how they felt about it, and they all thought it was like a great product because there's so many things with helmets, things like that, but nothing for the, the lower torso area or anything like that. And then as well, um, Dan plays football, so he was actually the one to wear the vest in multiple testings, and he felt that it was super comfortable, and he liked wearing it. It, felt, it made him feel safer. Um, the data that you're collecting, uh, what is your vision for, for that data in the future? Oh, so the main point of that is that right now there's so many injuries occurring specifically within football. So if we could take that data and we could see where athletes are hitting, where most of the pressure is going, we can kind of retrain them. So maybe they're hitting too high, they're hitting in the wrong spot, and they can use a different part of their body to hit or uh, hit in a different way. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Jaja Dickerson, this is Nasir Mason, and our other member is Perry Diaz, and we are Canes Club from University of Miami. So basically, our unmet need is, okay, this isn't working. All right, I'm going to just keep it going. So our unmet need, basically, what we are created is a device that creates better flow for surgical tubes. Right now, what they do um, after surgeries is that they have, the surgeons have to physically sew on the surgical drainage tube onto the body, like this image right here. They have to sew it on to the body, and that creates a lot of blockage for the blood and for any extra fluids to flow out. So basically what our device does is create a better way of flowing out so then it's now build up or back up and then it creates, a less, um, it creates less infections. So the way our concept works is that we have this device like this. Can you open it up? And it basically connects just like a Lego. You just open it up and then you connect it around the tube and basically it creates no blockage. It doesn't cut off any kind of circulation with the tube at all and it allows a better free flow um, with everything that has to go through it. Basically, there is no competition right now. Um, this is the only innovation that we have seen, that we have uh, created for this device. Um, we have, and we've done a lot of research on anything else that could possibly be done instead of the method that they are currently using, but we have not found anything in the, only, in the golden method right now is basically sewing it onto the body, which makes it uncomfortable for the patient as well. So we know that our device is very simple, but best believe it would create a very big impact in the surgical industry. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Um, how big is this problem? I, I wasn't sure I got that. It happens about 30% of the time after surgery, after outpatient, inpatient procedures. Okay. And what's the impact of this problem, of, of the, I guess, the blockages? It will cause readmission to hospitals, which will cause the hospital to have to pay the money because the patient will have to pay for that. Okay. All right. Uh, could you please give us some real world examples of what type of procedures would require uh, your, your device? Any procedure that will require, a tube, will require a tube insertion through subcutaneous skin, so that can be anywhere on the body. So various procedures, head, scalp, um, feet, anywhere with subcutaneous skin. Do you, uh, the, either of you have any direct experience in the, uh, in the, in the OR in the... So, so we do not, but yeah. our other partner, Perry, he was working with a surgeon and the surgeon said that they wanted something that was better conducive for the uh, procedure. Um, okay. And they said that the only thing that they have right now is the sewing method, the suture method. So that's why he was like, I want to create something else that would be better for oh, this procedure. Great. And quick follow-up, is that a prototype? Is that an actual? This is a prototype okay. that we have right now, yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Test? That's better. Okay. Can we restart my time? All right, thanks. Hi, everybody. My name is Joe Sleppy. I'm the CEO of Capacitech Energy. And this is a picture with me and my team after we completed a National Science Foundation SBIR grant where we created this, a cable-based capacitor, basically a wire that can store energy to complement the $50 billion rechargeable battery industry. Turns out when people get solar panels, they're really excited at first, but that excitement turns into a disappointment. They find out the panels aren't as good as they thought, and then tax incentives start to expire, then you gotta replace a battery after five years, and that battery's gonna cost you 30 grand over a 20 year period. Kinda stinks. And the root of that cause is that solar panels aren't as good as people hype them up to be. A 17% shadow coverage can result in 43% of lost power. As for the batteries, they're not designed to deliver every type of powered load in your home. Sometimes they're just not that efficient at it and they can lose 35% of their performance just trying to do a job that they weren't designed to do. And so we are commercializing a new type of energy storage component called a cable-based capacitor. This is a capacitor that can complement a battery so that it has more performance and longer operating life. That means you replace your batteries less often. Also, it's thin and it's flexible, which means we can embed it inside DC power cords rather than putting it on circuit boards, making things larger and larger. So if we look at a typical home, you've got photovoltaic panels connected to charge controllers, connected to batteries, all with DC power cords. We want to splice our cable-based capacitor inside those, cable, inside those DC power cords so that you get the capacitance, improving efficiency, and making a lot of other great things happen, such as making your panels resistant to shadow. When that, when that shadow crosses over, instead of losing the power, the capacitor will discharge, keeping the output consistent. Also, we'll complement that battery to have more performance, and all in all, this will save about $20,000 over a 20 year period. As for the competition, most people focus on materials with capacitors, and this has not worked out very well in the last decade for startups. So we're focusing on form factor instead. By being able to put this inside of a DC cord instead of on a circuit board, using it off of the circuit, we create a lot of different opportunities that have never been seen before, creating a new segment in the capacitor industry. Also, it reduces inventory costs and lead time for distribution companies, so we add value to them as well. That's actually a really big deal because those people pretty much sell to the end user. Last but not least, because our intellectual property is so unique, focusing on the form factor, we are able to actually uh, have more licensing opportunities and private labeling opportunities as well. Right now we're starting with solar, and we're starting with solar because we have a quick to adopt opportunity with solar. People are innovative, people are, are willing to try. And then we're gonna be scaling the same value proposition into information technology, healthcare, such as exoskeletons with Lockheed Martin, electric vehicles, and wind turbine. Last but not least, we've collected a lot of letters of support from Fortune 500 companies such as Jabel and Mouser, and all together these letters of support describe the willingness to do pilot programs and also to generate about $4 million in sales in the next year or two. Thanks. Go ahead. Sorry, I meant to give you guys a sample. This is a real working capacitor. You can bend it if you want. It's about four millimeters wide, 10 centimeters long. Um, 
and has two farads of capacitance. So that means it could deliver two amps in one second or vice versa. Great. Staying in solar with the team we have today, what's your plan to get it to market? How do you get out and let people know you, you're right. alive? So we're working with a company that's local to us called UMA Solar. They're a large equipment distribution company, and they're basically being our sales and marketing force to solar installation companies. They're telling us exactly the specs we need to have, exactly how our marketing should look, and so that's a really great partner. Also, my team isn't just me. I have Dr. Isaiah Olade. He's our CTO. I also have Sabi Prasad sitting in the crowd. She's doing our chief of sales and marketing type work, and all together we have some experience in solar, and we're, we're driving that home. We're setting up pilot programs right now. That's the next step. Uh, what, what are your steps to a marketable product? So, first thing is we need to set up a more scalable manufacturing. So, currently we can only make about 10 units by hand, and that's not very scalable. So, we're implementing a manufacturing line so that we can do larger orders and do larger pilot programs. That's the first step. The second thing that we really need is to get a UL certification, which is kind of like FDA approval for electronic components. Those two things are what those letters of support identify. If you can show that you can produce this on a regular basis with a secure supply chain and you're able to get the UL listing, I'm willing to buy X amount from you. So at scale, uh, how many of these would, would t go into a typical uh, solar uh, application. So a if I have one solar cell, how many of these would, capacitors would typically fit into it? Right. So a typical solar home will have uh, typically a 60-volt system with a 48-volt battery. None of that really matters. What's going to be is our, we'll sell our product for about $350 to $500, depending on how many solar panels you have connected. And so that would be uh, a, about 100 cells of our capacitor. And then the SBIR grant that you got, mm -hmm. uh, that you actually received that grant? We received and spent $225,000 okay. to develop the technology. That's a real working prototype. Yes. <laughs> you can talk to me later if you want. Hello. My name is Aaron Syrah. I'm presenting a product that has the potential to liquidate billions of dollars in an ever-growing global market. Um, I am presenting on behalf of the University of Miami and um, Just go ahead oh, use the microphone. microphone. Yeah. Is it a, all right, cool. And on behalf of my senior design team, Christian Marquina, Jonathan Bound, and Peter Stansky. Our product is called Laissez Feast, and it won Best Display at University's Senior Design Expo yesterday, which we're very proud of. Um, the problems faced by the typical consumer that wishes to feed their pet the highest quality food they can are often time consuming and messy. However, between uh, two meals a day, um, you will feed a, a dog similar to Bo here, which weighs about 45 pounds, nearly a pound of meat and vegetables um, if you're providing the highest quality food, which can take up to an hour to prepare per meal. Most people do not have the time or money to feed their pet the highest quality diet that is possible. However, they do waste a lot of time feeding their pet, oh, sorry, I forgot about that, um, feeding their pet food that has relatively low nutritional value in comparison. So, uh, the solution that we have um, is something where, imagine filling a storage container of food, uh, about five days worth of food, pressing buttons to set the volume at which the food will be dispensed and the time interval, and then not having to worry about feeding your pet again until that container is empty. Um, or imagine having um, a very young animal that has just adopted puppy or kitten and not having to wake up every 30 minutes to an hour to feed them. Instead, you can use the laissez-feast laissez product to... Um, Let's see. Uh, yeah, and okay, so you can use this, and it, it essentially does all of that for you. And um, the competition is basically non existent as far as the ability to fully automate feeding. There are products such as Pawbot that are prototypes and are not on the market, which can serve small cans of food. And there's something called Cats and Pup, which is a clamp that will peel back the lid of a um, small portion. And then there are things that you are um, useful for, oops, for the use of uh, dry food. But nothing does everything that the Laze Feast product does. Um, so it is fully automated, programmable, and hands-free and remote-controlled. 
And the a major effect this will have, is that it? No, <laughs> a major effect this will have is on the pet industry as a whole for specifically people that are busy and need to feed their pet on a very varying schedule. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so yeah, we've got time for a couple questions. What do you guys have to ask? Great, how close are you to a product? We have a prototype that is functioning as of right now. What it does is it will store and dispense the food. However, in order to uh, store that food safely, it must be cooled in a refrigerator beforehand, and then our device will maintain that temperature at a safe level around 45 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. Uh, we have a prototype that is in existence already and functions. Is it available to see? Um, it is not, it's not available in the market to be purchased as of yet. However, we're working on manufacturing and we're working through the University of Miami to patent and trademark the product. So having a product that's targeting pets and having a pet on stage with you, you kind of grab everybody's attention. Right. But in, I'm not clear on exactly what I'm buying. Yes, so we don't have the prototype here to show you. However, essentially it will be something about this tall that will have a part of it where you would put food in to store and then a second part where it's all self-contained, but it will be a um, cooling unit that will keep that storage container a safe temperature with a dispensing mechanism at the bottom and it will be on a platform where you slide the bowl underneath it and the food dispenses directly into that bowl for the pet to consume. And how much demand is there for uh, non-drive food products for so there's been a, a growing um, consumer de demand for uh, more healthy options for feeding pets um, Peter can speak a bit more about that since he has a pet and yeah so <clears throat> within the uh, um, you know rising um, health conscious era that we live in today that's also translated over to the pet industry so within that Amazon alone last year made 1.4 billion dollars in sales and um, we're looking to make about 70 million off of our product from that, um, looking at advertising to the top 5% of consumers in that market. Thank you. Good morning, we're Dorelis and Juan representing FIU with the, the idea of SLAB, which is the Enterprise Computer Integration for Law Enforcement Operational Picture. If you look closely at the name of our team, is the word police backwards, and this is because we're trying to modernize the way that police departments do roll call briefings. So what is roll call? It's the first 15 to 20 minutes of every police shift that is spent at the station where the officers are briefed about imp important information. This is mostly done uh, in paper or using old systems that are not integrated with the modern information technology. Uh, what happens is that some of the officers are not able to attend the meeting because they might be in court or they may be doing over overlapping shifts. Um, so they're not able to be briefed. Another problem is even if the officer was able to go to the meeting, if something comes up in the middle of the day, it's hard to distribute new information. This problem was actually brought up to us by the Pinecrest Police Department uh, which, uh, based on their own struggles and needs. So we've been working with them for the past three years in a SaaS application called Virtual Roll Call Briefing, uh, which allows the officer to have more time to patrol and increases their productivity by eliminating the need to be in person at the station. So it provides real-time information distribution, and it has um, interactive maps that help the officer make a route and visit the places they need to go for the day. So we know there are some leader, leading competitors out there, like SunGuard, Superior and SmartForce, and Lexington Systems. However, they do not provide a solution specific to briefings without purchasing their whole system, and that comes out very pricey. Also, uh, we, um, we also provide real-time information sharing and interactive maps, uh, which these other systems do not provide. Um, to demonstrate the potential of our um, product, I would like to point out that the Pinecrest Police Department won the 2018 Leadership Award at the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and this is one of the highest awards in the policing world. I would I also like to point out that this product has been live at the Pinecrest Police Department for over a year now, and they're very happy with the product. We're also talking to other police departments like the city of Doral and Hialeah Gardens, and they're ready to start using our product as well. 
So if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer, and here's our contact information as well. Hi, uh, can you give us any information about the savings that the police department have made as a result of using the system? The improvement? Okay, yeah, for example, they save time, like in a small uh, department like Pinecrest, with the time saved with the using this system, they is kind of like represent to um, one officer, a full time a officer, officer. Right taking care of all care. Also, it saved the case, for example, there are some cases, I don't say like holy happen, but are some cases that because of this situation, they have to go to a room, be briefed. There are some times that you cannot find police in, uh, patrol in the street because they are either in the, in the briefing room or the one that are finishing the shift, they are going home. So there is exactly nobody there. There's a gap on time where the officers are leaving the shift and the other ones are being briefed. So that's unsafe time at the streets. So this saves because they can be briefed in the computers of their cars in real time. So they can do it at their own time. Um, what is the benefit of your product versus any other software that maybe is not specific to police, but is more around productivity or even uh, well, project um, management? This product was built specifically to solve this problem that they're having. So the efficiency is better because the other system is built to more like a management process, like crime management, all these other areas and the, for the policing that is have to do. This um, virtual road call briefing is based to solve this problem that they have. And it's a problem that many, many stations, like if you ask a chief, it's right there, they, they can tell you that they can find this problem in other uh, police stations. Over, over the past 20 years, there have been a number of PC-based in-vehicle systems, fully kind of robust systems. Do you see those folks as your, uh, as your partners? Do you see those as potential alliances? Do you see those as... Um, as a market, I, I, I mean, at this moment we are. This is a, a soft system, which is a service we're gonna host it on, on the Pinecrest station right now to avoid some certificate um, compliance. compliance that we had to to be. But we at this point we don't see us integrating to other systems that they have right now. Okay. But right. it can happen in the future. Oh, sorry. Okay. Hello. Great. <clears throat> Hello everyone, my name is Dominic Eloise. I'm here as part of the University of Florida and my company Source. We are developing a solar energy generator that is going to change the world. So as a customer who's looking for renewable energy, I want clean and consistent power as well as an effect on my utility bill. Well, did you know that 80% of people who want solar panels actually can't install them? And that's due to four main reasons. Initially, they don't have enough money for the principal investment of $12,500 for a five kilowatt system, which is the average in the United States. Their location is not optimal for direct sunlight contact. They consume too much power that's rated for the systems. As well as this, their available space on their homes, because they need to be on the roofs, is not effective. They need 27 square meters on every house. Our solution to that problem tackles all four of those categories. It's called Source. It's a patented, low-cost, low-temperature Stirling engine paired with a solar thermal collector. This system cost is nearly 50% of solar panels at $7,250. And if you do the math, it comes out to about eight and a half years of return on investment. Not only that, it delivers these statistics for nine square meters on your home, which is one-third of the size of solar panels, and it operates for 10 hours per day. Now, if I was a customer and I wanted to go and get renewable energy for my home, I would go to a company like First Solar or SunPower, and I would be forced to go into a product that cost me $12,500 after tax credits and take 17 years to see that money back for me on my investment. And not only that, it's going to take up my whole roof because it's 27 square meters on the top. Now, I went to Puerto Rico the other day, well, the other month, and I looked up, and I saw energy generators and the power lines up, and I thought to myself, wow, if there was a hurricane, I bet you they'd be out of power for a while. 
I went into my Uber a little bit later. I asked him that, and he confirmed my suspicions. His family was out of power for three months after the last wave of hurricanes hit. With my product, that would have not happened. My product delivers clean, consistent power throughout all terrain, even when the clouds are out. That's my mission. That is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because basic rights, his ability to clean, cook, and even shave, those are basic, and that should happen. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be something that we think about. And that's my mission, and that's what I want you guys to join. So thank you, and let's redefine solar. Are you uh, getting any interest from any commercial uh, potential partners? Yeah, um, so these solar collectors are produced by a company called Arctic Solar. And we um, have partnered with them. They've agreed to give us in-kind donation for all of the equipment uh, and fittings that we need, um, which we d use to develop the first prototype, and we will be using to develop the rest of the system to optimize, uh, to optimize the system, actually. So those are some of our numbers as well. Have you done any testing in real world situations to see the, if the production of the, the solar power meets your expectations? Yeah, so I, I, I have an office space in Gainesville and it's part of a commercial park and we have some solars installed there that we've done the testing with and we've attached power meters to it and we've confirmed that it creates five kilowatt hours of en or five kilowatts of energy from the system. And are you able to store that energy to use later? So that is one of the next steps in development. You know, we've gotten some advice from Arctic Solar as well as, you know, Duke Energy, who's just gave $20 million to the university to fund some, some solar energy, but kind of want to stay away from that. Um, but they, um, so yes, the, the system is operating, but it's not at a residential level. We don't have it on a home. I have it working at my business and it's powering. Um, and we're deciding between the grid centered approach or, you know, a centralized uh, power where you know, you'd plug in appliances to it, your major appliances um, throughout the year. Because that might be more effective in places like Puerto Rico who have five major appliances that they're looking to use rather than go into a grid that's really, really bad. It could be an initial product as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time, guys. I appreciate it. Hello everyone, my name is Mike Geldart and I'm the CEO of GRD Biomechanics. And at GRD, we believe that pain-free mobility enables people to do more of what they love. And that knee pain in particular is one of the biggest dampers on mobility freedom. As such, we decided to completely reinvent the knee brace. Our product can be used in physical therapy, pre and post applications, and even injury prevention. We're currently in a pilot program at an Orlando Health Clinic. Our technology has been validated by a 20 athlete IRB study. We're expanding to a multi clinic pilot program later on this month, and we're going to mainstream sales late this summer with our distribution partner, Real Surgical. Our problem is that 1 million. There are 1 million knee surgeries a year. Three out of four U.S. adults over the age of 45 suffer from knee pain in some form or another. And that this is a huge problem because it's, it's a costly problem. It can cost over $4,400 a year to treat annually. And it can cause additional problems such as heart problems, obesity, and depression. Ascend is the answer to this problem. We designed a new type of patent-pending muscle augmentation technology, which lowers the load in the quadricep muscles, thus lowering the load in the joint, con the joint contact forces and on the surrounding ligaments. We package it in this super cool 3D printed frame, so it's going to fit you perfectly the first time because all of our sizing is custom. It weighs less than 1.2 pounds, and it's going to cost less than $1,000, less than our competitors. One of the other problems with customized bracing is that there's a, there's a complicated purchasing process. There's additional hidden fees that you don't know about. There's additional trips to the doctor after that. And there's a long waiting times of four to six weeks. We streamline all of that by arming the clinic with an iPad and 3D scanning system, which has, an, which has our app embedded. In, instead of having to go back to the doctor, we do everything in the same day so that, that, you can, so that we can ship your device out a week later. We're operating in a $4 billion market, and as such, we have some competition. But where we really step ahead is by having a combination of muscle augmentation technology, 
of simplified purchasing experience and full custom sizing. With Donjoin Oser, it's a complicated purchasing process, no muscle augmentation, but you do get cu customized sizing. With Spring Loaded, you get muscle augmentation, but you have to pray that you fit in one of their three standard sizes. At GRD, we are always looking for new individuals and organizations to partner with. If you're interested in working with us, please come see me afterward. Thank you for your time, and I'd like to invite any questions. Hi, can you tell us a little bit about how your brace differs from what's out there today, other than the customizable, but how it uh, distributes the pressures or? Sure, so really most of the braces, um, so we'll use Don Joy an example, because they all have all the college football players. So that's really just a rigid frame. Um, it, the technology hasn't changed in the last 20 years. And really what we do is lower the load in the quadricep muscle, which lowers the load on the joint contact forces, which lowers the joint contact forces in the surrounding ligaments. And our new research even suggests that it can help you become less quad dominant, which is the whole point of ACL rehab. It's distributing the load to the, the glute and the calf muscle. Um, what kind of feedback have you heard from people who've actually worn it during your pilots? They absolutely love it. Um, it, it fits them perfectly the, the first time. Um, we, uh, it, they, they really, really like it. They can feel the level of assistance. Um, and the doctors actually really like it from a clinic standpoint because there's an addition with a customized brace, there's additional two trips to the doctor for the patient to meet with a sales rep. So it's tying up two additional uh, clinic rooms that they're not actually making money off of and it's jamming up their workflow. So they were like almost pushing us to say, really, all we have to do is scan the patient, like taking a video with your phone and all the dimensions are done. I said, yep, we completely take it over there. So they like, they're, they're, so there's a, there's kind of a dual level value proposition there as well. Maybe a follow up to that question. Have you had the opportunity to do kind of a bake off with some of the others because there are so many out there and you're design focused. When I say a bake-off, have you compared the same athlete with multiple options for braces? We, we didn't get a chance to run that in our, our limited study on IRB, but it's something we're looking at to investigate in the future. I mean, right now, you know, braced versus unbraced, there's, there's the, the research that we're looking at, and from a physical therapy standpoint, we're looking at muscle activation and muscle building. So there's, there's no spring system or anything that, that would even cause that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We're Team Nixus, which is Latin for pressure. We are a team of biomedical engineers who have designed the future of compression therapy. So compression therapy is often used to treat a disease known as lymphedema, which is an incurable condition that involves the buildup of fluid in the lower extremities of the body. It is most likely to affect those who either have a genetic predisposition for it or those who have undergone some form of cancer therapy. There are 10 million people right here in the United States who suffer from the disease, and 250 million people worldwide. The current market for compression therapy is $2.9 billion, billion with a B. However, a lot of this money is being wasted because only 40% of patients are actually using the devices that they are being prescribed, and we wanted to know why that was. So we worked alongside physicians and found nine major complaints with the current devices. We found that they are unhygienic because they are not machine washable, so they end up stinking. Additionally, they are uncomfortable. They're basically big bulky airbags that are wrapped around the patient's leg. And worst of all, they are extremely restrictive. The device needs to be plugged into the wall with the person sitting down for up to an hour, two to three times a day, every day which totals up to 1,100 hours every year for the rest of their life. Our competition isn't smart, mobile, or high-tech, and this is unacceptable. The Nixus device brings this technology into the 21st century. Our device addresses all of the nine complaints of the current device. Of great significance, our device is comfortable, in that it is lightweight and form-fitted to the leg. It is easily washable, as you simply throw the inner lining into the laundry with the rest of your clothes. But most importantly, our device is liberating. Therapy treatments can be applied while going about your daily activity. Patients are no longer bound to a chair. Our innovation was inspired by soft robotic technology, utilizing a trainable metal that has yet to be used in the medical field. Our trained metal, shaped like springs, contracts when electrical current is applied. 
tightening the bands around the leg. Tested and proven, our device is resilient in strength and durability. In addition to all this, we have developed the first smart compression device, connected directly to your phone to track treatments, set reminders, and adds patient accountability. Thank you for your time, and welcome to the liberating future of compression technology. You know, what I found interesting, you have a, a spring that appears to be uh, a part of the secret sauce of how this thing works. And so anytime you train metal or heat treat or some other type of treatment of metal, it's got to be extremely precise. So how far along are you in the development of that technology? Exactly. We have tested out five different prototype actuators. Uh, and the way that this has to be done is correct. Specific temperatures at annealing times in order to get the properties that we have achieved in our actuators to make it flexible. And so you've got a nice repeatable process that's been... Yes, it is repeatable and has been done. Great. This is yours, not off-the-shelf technologies. You didn't take... Uh you didn't take some existing? Oh, no. We uh, literally went out, talked to physicians, found this problem, and then just looked online for what is something that can be flexible, because it needs to be flexible and lightweight to work. And we were inspired by soft robotics, because soft robotics, a lot of times, are used in the military. And so we were like, we need to take this and bring it to the medical field, because this, it, the current devices are completely outdated. Okay, so the design is entirely yours? Entirely ours. We're working on a provisional patent. Um, do you need any FDA or other approvals to bring your products to market? And if so, where are you in that life cycle? Yes, yeah, so we're working on um, getting a pilot study and then do a little bit of um, redesigning if necessary and then go to clinical trials um, to get FDA approval, um, possibly through the 510K pathway. Uh, so you mentioned you're, doing, you're going to do pilots, but have you tested this with actual um, patients? So I've patients? tested it. We haven't tested it with a uh, lymphedema patient, but I've tested it on myself, and it just feels like a nice little leg massage. In addition, we've had two physicians actually seen our first prototype and have evaluated it as far as giving us critiques to improve it. And as our current design in our mathematical model for making a therapeutic treatment, it is functional. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, we're Team NERD. NERD actually stands for Nearby Robotic Delivery Service, and we're an autonomous delivery robot company. So our main problem is called the last mile problem. The last mile problem describes the movement of goods from a final destination hub to its final destination, usually a consumer's house. So it's a 2.5, there's 25 billion packages being delivered on a yearly basis, and those all packages all deal with the last mile problem. In our case, we are targeting FAU and college campuses, which exhibit the last mile problem as well, because they're a confined urban environment. Right now, we're specifically looking at food delivery, and as of right now, that's a $2.3 billion industry with just food delivery. So our robot is made to deliver things such as food and packages in landlocked environments, such as college campuses like FAU or business campuses where um, many of the buildings are not accessible to cars um, for food delivery and package delivery. So our robot is people friendly. It goes on the sidewalks and travels at about four miles per hour, thus not to endanger anyone and to um, go at a safe speed to walk around. Um, we can carry about three shopping bags or um, one package in our robot, um, anything below 20 pounds. Uh, we're able to detect and move around any stationary objects as well as people. So if there's um, a pole that's to keep cars off, we can navigate around that. We can also navigate with the floor of traffic um, of people on the sidewalks. Um, our robot is 95% autonomous. The reason we say 95% is because um, for safety reasons, we always have a human watching what the robot is doing um, just to make sure there are no incidents and to be able to prove that we can operate autonomously. So our advantage over other companies is many companies like Amazon or um, they're trying to do air delivery. So one problem with drone delivery is that the FAA currently has regulations where you cannot fly a drone out of your line of sight. Obviously this is problematic for companies that want to do autonomous delivery because if you are out of sight of a drone operator, it's considered illegal and you would not be able to do it. 
Uh, we're an on-demand service, so you would open our app, and just like Uber Eats or other companies, you would choose the restaurant you want to order from, and you would um, pick whatever meal you want. The robot would then um, go to the restaurant, such as Wendy's or something, which we have on our campus, while the food is being prepared. Once the food is prepared, it would be loaded into the robot on the in the delivery bay, and the restaurant would hit their side of the app, causing the robot to come to you at your exact location. So we're Team Nerd, and we'd like to take any questions you have. Um, so how does, how does it work if um, somebody tries to intercept with the robot? And like, does that, is that, is it protected in some way for the end customer to know that I'm the only one who's going to be able to open it? Yes, definitely. So um, our robot, there's no outside handles or anything. It's completely locked with um, solenoids. So on the app, there will be a button that you press on the app. The robot is connected through the cellular network. So once you um, hit open robot, it'll open once it's at your location. It also has a gyroscopic and accelerometer sensors so that if the robot feels that it's being picked up or shaken or anything, trying to get food out of it, it will want to alert us at the central delivery hub, and it will also notify um, FAU Police Department. Uh, do you need somebody at the receiving end to take the packages out, or is there a mechanism for delivering if, if somebody's not there? So currently, we, you do need somebody to take out their package or their food. Um, they can remotely open the door. Let, if they're not able to go get the package themselves, they can use the app to open it for someone else. Any licensing issues relative to the being out on the on the road? So the only problem we have right now is with FAU specifically. So we're targeting specific campuses because campuses define the rules on their set grounds. So we found this out through our business advisor, and he's told us basically if FAU approves it, then they set the rules for it. So if they approve us being on the sidewalks in their roads, then nobody can stop us, and we don't have to go to outside sources. So are you building the robot, or is that something that's being built by someone else? We are building it from scratch. So we're not selling the robots directly. We are offering it as a service. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye. Okay, may I? Uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Valery Spiridonov. I'm getting my master's degree at Florida Atlantic University. And I have an amazing team of professionals in their domains. They do uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, and even avionics to solve the problem we are talking about. So um, the main problem is that a person, a human, cannot be present in different places at the same time. So um, what we offer to do is offering a solution when everybody can connect to a distant drone anywhere in the world and get real-time picture of what's going on on that place and even ability to control that drone. So um, this startup has an Uber-like economy. Uh, we produce drones and we produce a platform uh, which will be able to serve these drones and um, Basically, people can get uh, profit from this, and people can get services. So um, this is demanded by universities, by seniors, by those who are willing to travel but cannot uh, for different reasons. Uh, because it's expensive, because it's uh, difficult to do. Uh, it, it is demanded by managers. It is demanded by uh, construction workers who want to observe sites in real time. It is demanded by uh, city authorities who want to monitor traffic and uh, what's going on in the city. So uh, we offer this kind of solution. Uh, it's called NetFly, and uh, I'm ready to answer your questions. So what's the advantage of having real-time versus uh, products that are on the market right now that do a very nice job of, of giving you uh, a virtual, you know, virtual trip to wherever you want to go. Okay, uh, in some cases you want to have a real-time picture of what's going on. It's uh, in cases of uh, monitoring traffic, for example, 
or um, being able to observe for the construction site, or in cases like, uh, you know, you want to move to Japan to observe uh, blooming of sakura or gardens of Vizcaya in the spring, but you cannot afford it, or you want just uh, to have an opinion about this. And you just connect to a drone, you get a picture, and uh, you can do it from the comfort of your home. So uh, why you want to do this in real time? Because uh, it's always changing, the world is changing, and you want to interact it in a new way. So is this intended to be an alternative to the vacation or an encouragement to take the vacation? Absolutely, sir. Oh. And, and so you mentioned that a competitor is, the, is B2B drones. Uh, yes, there are no other competitors because um, even B2B drones, they are mostly uh, offline. So you like go to a company, you order a filming and they send it to you uh, after a week or so. And it's not a real time and it's really expensive and uh, you cannot change uh, the point of view, uh, whatever you like. So it's a real problem. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Andrew Boyer. And my name is Maria Fiaggio. Uh, together we are Project Suite. Uh, we're really excited to be here today to share with you our uh, solution for transport transporting and, and sterilizing water in impoverished communities. So in the United States, we have the luxury of accessing clean water wherever and whenever we want it. Um, unfortunately, m communities around the world, over two billion people, more than a quarter of the world's population, lacks access to safe drinking water on a regular basis. So in uh, last September, I went to South America and I got to live and breathe the daily struggles of one of these communities. Um, here in the northern deserts of, of Colombia, you'll find the indigenous tribe of the Waiyu community. Um, here, like countless communities around the world, women and children walk for over three miles and up to six hours every single day just to collect their water. I spoke with mothers who carry water over their heads and on their backs. Uh, putting themselves at risk of injury, as well as losing precious time they could be spending going to school and going to work. And to think that women around the world are doing this for water that isn't even clean. Uh, the World Health Organization has classified uh, waterborne diseases such as cholera, diarrhea, and hepatitis A as a second leading cause of death for these types of community, communities. So it begs the question, um, how can we create a solution that makes transportation easier um, and sterilization of water more accessible for these types of communities. So our proposed solution is the SWEET roller. SWEET stands for Sterilized Water Energy Efficient Transport. Um, and as the name implies, the SWEET roller uh, offers two unique value propositions. First is transportation, and second is the sterilization of water. Um, and it does all of this at an affordable cost. Our product can hold up to 75 liters of water. This is the average cleaning, cooking, and drinking uh, needs for an average family of five. This eliminates the multiple trips that need to be taken to the water source and frees up their time for um, energy and doing other activities. Um, our product can clean uh, water, a whole volume, for within the 15 minutes, which means that by the time our user gets home, 99.9% .9 of bacteria and pathogens in the water will already be neutralized. And our product is affordable, which um, we expect that by using low-cost material and uh, manufacturing techniques that we can um, sell our product by a price of $31 with leaving a contribution margin of $4. And this is how the sweet roller works. Um, while our, users, our user walks to the water source, fills up the, the roller, particulate matter like sand, dirt, or leaves get eliminated by a mesh filter over the lid. While the user rolls the water back home, kinetic energy is harnessed by a generator which um, turns it into electrical energy to power up a UV sterilization unit which sterilizes the water. While there are other um, products in the market that are trying to address the same issue as ours, the only alternatives, they, they only offer either sterilization or transportation. So with your help, um, we hope to make the lives of these impoverished communities sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, could you tell us a little bit about the roller and how it's designed to handle uh, dirt roads or, or less than perfect conditions? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the roller itself is a product that exists on the market already, uh, like the photo you see here. 
Um, it's built with a really robust material, a type of plastic that's UV treated. Um, so it can withstand the bumps and bruises of going through these types of terrains. It's also uh, easy to roll around because you actually feel one-ninth of the weight that you're carrying. So a woman or a child could carry this. Um, our innovation is adding the, co the cleaning component and using that already existing behavior of rolling and carrying the water back to your home to actually power something that's going to make the water uh, potable. How many uses does one of these get? Like how, how many trips back and forth? Yeah, so like the, I mean, the, the, the plastic itself is not a limiting factor. Um, I think the limiting factor will be the UV sterilization unit, actually the UV LEDs that are inside, but they do have a lifespan of about seven years. So um, we can expect that these will run for at least seven years. Beyond the UV, uh, beyond the UV uh, treatment, is there anything else, or does that complete most everything you're looking to? Yeah, so the main contaminant for these types of communities is fecal bacteria um, and bi biological contaminants. Um, what we want to do in future uses is have a, f a filter that removes heavy metals. So that's the only other contaminant that may be present in some types of uh, water sources. Quick last one, is there a prototype? Yeah, so we have a proof of concept we developed uh, last, late last year, and we ran that one into the ground with testing basically, but throughout this year we're building a full-scale manufacturable model. So I cut a lot of grass, and I roll my grass to get my yard flat. Looks a lot like this. Yeah. Uh, very heavy very difficult to move, not real easy to move, and it's made out of plastic. So I'm just curious if you have size, if, am I looking at the wrong size, or is it closer to the size of what she was carrying on her head? So this one, this one here is about 100 liters. It would be three quarters of the size, which makes it easier to move around. Thank you. I think we're done. Thank you very much. So I think it's time now for the jury to deliberate and uh, tally the scores. We're going to give them a few minutes. And uh, we are going to invite on the podium our, our former senator, Senator René Garcia. Is he in the room? Oh, right here. <clears throat> Let me introduce our senator. Okay. He has, uh, he has had a very long career as elected official in the state of Florida. He served as Florida senators from 2008 to 2015. And before serving as senators, he served four terms in the Florida House of Representatives. That was between 2000 and 2008. Before that, he held a position in the Ayalea City Council. So he was born in the same city and attended Miami-Dade Community College, then Florida International University, where he received a degree in political science in 1999. He also a graduate from University of Miami, where he received a Master of Business Administration in healthcare administration. So uh, throughout the career, uh, I've seen consistent, uh, the same message coming from the senator. Government should be the voice for the voiceless. Senator. Thank you, Dean. And may I add, you have a, a really stellar tie there, you know. So, but anyway, I know we can't be impartial here, partial, so it's all about the you for me some t most of the time. So, but anyway, except for today, but it really is an honor and a privilege to be here with you all today to talk to you. And I had this great speech that my staff put together talking about the, the intersection of technology and engineering and, and society and government. But the reality is, I don't need to be talking about that. You guys are doing it all today. It's really impressive to see what innovation is coming from Florida universities. It's really impressive to see the level uh, of, um, of input and time that you put into all these projects that you are presenting today to change the way the world is. But always remember the one thing that you always, always got going to need is you are going to need government because unfortunately government, um, for most part, 
uh, regulate a lot of the issues that you're talking about. When we talk about health care, we're talking about uh, economic development or, or fresh drinking water or even with our pets and how we are able to provide uh, food for our pets. That in itself, all, a lot of those things are regulated through government. So as you provide these informations and you come up with these new technologies, always remember that we need to start educating a lot of our elected officials on the, uh, on the, on the great uses of technology innovation in the way that we uh, perform our, our, uh, our daily lives, correct? Look, what, look at one of the things that we talked about here. Um, well, we didn't talk about it today, but one of the issues that we just recently passed in the le Florida legislature was the use of telemedicine. Telemedicine, we've been talking about telemedicine for years in this country, but yet Florida was lagging behind because of a lot of different issues, a lot of different issues on, on how telemedicine was going to be applied, who can use it, who cannot, how you were going to be reimbursed for that telemedicine, what providers were going to be able to use it, could you use out-of-state providers as opposed to in-state providers, and those are issues that with technology, um, are, we have to address all those issues through technology at every single state until the federal government passes certain regulations, obviously, that affect uh, the whole nation. So always remember that we have to include legislative bodies, whether local, state, or county bodies, and some of the technologies that are being introduced into our, our societies. Um, autonomous vehicles, one of the things that we've talked about, we see these autonomous vehicles in the road and not in every state, but here in Florida is one of the pilot states uh, that we can use autonomous vehicles. And that in itself took a couple of years in the legislature for that bill to come a reality. And now you see the use of autonom autonomous vehicles here in Florida uh, through prototypes and, and making sure they work out the kinks, but that in itself, again, took a couple of years uh, to get that going through through the Florida legislature. Uh, the other issue that we see uh, where technology is being intersected with government is in education. You know, we see, oh, well, obviously we have a lot of uh, technology merging in, in education and, and, edu and, and the way we educate and get information out to, to our students, but in itself, that's all regulated through government. And one of the greatest advances that we've seen in education, right, has been the virtual schooling and being able to teach our students in their homes or being able to teach them remotely through the use of technology in the web and, um, and, and, and the other regulatory schemes that exist from the Department of Education. So all those are, are things that are happening on a daily basis. And the reality is that when I got up here and I was going to start talking to you, I was going to give you all these facts and figures, and they're really, I don't need to be giving that to you because you already have that. And, I, and through the use of engineers, engineers like yourself, I want you to believe this. And you see these projects that you all came in here, I'm glad that I'm not one of the judges because you guys... I mean, it's going to be very hard to judge and to be able to pick one over the other because everyone has a unique perspective in a different field. And that is all coming through engineers themselves. You all are the ones that are transforming the world. While, yes, healthcare, education, um, aerospace, uh, any other sector of the economy that you can talk about, we need engineers because you're the ones that are changing it on a day-to-day -day basis. You're the ones that are seeing where the chances and opportunities exist to, in order to make our lives better. And if you talk to someone like my father, my father would say, oh, no, technology is a very scary thing. Technology is going to be the end of the world. But that's because imagine what that generation has seen. The advancements that an 86-year-old man has seen from the time that he was out living in the farm where he, there was one TV maybe, he was lucky, one TV in the whole neighborhood and maybe limited access to phones to fast forward 80 years later and you see the amount of advancement that has happened in his life. And that's why for individuals like him, they find it a little bit scary. And individuals like me, who grew up in an era with Nintendos and, and Ataris, and we had fast forward from that to almost virtual gaming, to the use of technology on a phone, and even for me, an Alexa scares the bejesus out of me. 
you know, thinking that I can talk to someone on the, on, at Alexa and she's going to give me all this information. And my fear is also privacy issues. Like, what, what are they going to be listening to me? What are they going to be listening? When, what, what, what are they going to be hearing when I, when I talk with on, uh, or ask Alexa anything? So the reality is that as every generation advances, there's always some trepidation, trepidation and some fear as technology advances. And that's why it's important for you as the next, as a generation, it's up and coming. I'm not even going to say the next generation because you guys are doing it now, is to make sure that we use this technology for the good, for the positive, to make sure that we do transform the world, transform the world and make it easier for the individuals to be able to access information, to be able to transport themselves to other areas that they haven't been able to see, to be able to use the, the World Wide Web and use information that's out there to, to learn about different cultures and civilizations and see how they do it. To make sure that we provide fresh drinking water to individuals who, who have none. You know, So that is what's on your shoulders right now. Don't allow and don't you allow the, the, um, the negative or the, the, political, the negative political discourse that exists today to stop that motivation that you have. Let's use that negative political discourse that we're hearing in today's society to ensure that we do and transform it and make it into a positive. Make it into a positive to ensure that societies and people like us can live a lot longer, healthier, more positive life, interacting with one another and understanding that we and other, all of us have our differences. And not fighting over those differences, but learning to collaborate and learning to, to, to work together on what makes us equal. And that's just... What is being a human, a human race? That's what makes it powerful. And through the use of engineering and through the engineering and through the use of us technology, we can accomplish all these goals. So when I look at you and I look at all of you, I really think that the future is incredibly bright, incredibly bright. And, and, and it's up to you to move forward. Move forward, and if something fails, go back and, and, and do it again and keep on doing it. And just because you fail, don't stop. And I say that to all of you because I know how difficult it must be coming up with these different prototypes. I couldn't even begin to start coming up with any of these uh, ideas. The fact that it's an idea that's coming out of your mind, it's impressive enough for me. And that's why, for me as a former state legislator, it's important, and I stress the importance of you and your engineering societies to reach out to elected officials so they can understand the important role that every single one of you play. The important role that our universities here in the state of Florida are playing in changing our lives. And, if, and, if, and it's important, that's why I say it's important for you to get out and meet them and bring them into your campuses, bring them into your programs like we did, Dean, to understand everything that is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Because at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, a lot of these regulatory components that will allow you to, to grow, will allow you to expand, will allow you to bring some, a new product to market, will come through the regulatory schemes that exist at our different states and at different state capitals. So it's incumbent upon you and your universities and your deans to reach out, to reach out and educate uh, the next generation of elected officials so they can not, so they, for one, not be scared or worried about the technological advances that are coming through your sector. Because if we do that, and we go back to Tallahassee, since we're all state schools here, state colleges and state, yeah, state universities, and a couple of private ones, I'll tell you this, if we start doing that, you can start seeing the advancement quicker in our own state. For example, when we t and I'll give you an exa another example that we had some, some difficult time in Tallahassee with the issue of, uh, of um, solar, solar, solar panels and the, and the tax credits and so forth. That in itself, just because it's a great idea to expand the use of solar energy in our state, we in this room think it's a great idea. But for every great idea, there's someone that's detracting and someone on the other side that's fighting against it. And who would you think that was fighting against the use of solar panels in the state of Florida? FPL. I'm not going to mention FPL, but FPL it was. Okay. <laughs> and that's not only FPL, but all the energy companies were fighting against it. So they, what they did, in their infinite wisdom, which I, uh, a lot of the energy folks 
were out there, and I don't want to call out one company over another, but what they did, they put out a referendum. They put out a ballot initiative through the legislature that the legislature voted on uh, for these tax credits and so forth on solar paneling. But the reality is that it really limited the amount, I thought, it limited the amount of solar panels, solar power that can be generated and reused and resold back to, to the energy companies. So that's why it's incumbent, it's important on all of us, and this is for those of us that are not engineered and so forth that are involved in the political process, always to read the, these, these, um, these constitutional amendments that come forward and try to find out where they are coming from and how they will affect uh, our daily lives. Um, and that's why I always find it incredible to, to see individuals like yourselves that, that are involved and so heavily involved in, in trying to change our world. But always remember, always remember that we have to get our elected class uh, motivated and involved in order to be able to move our products forward. So, so with that, I'll tell you that I feel very confident in all of you and, and the work that you have done and the products that you have presented today I mean, if I had the money, I'd be investing in every single one of them um, or putting you in touch with individuals I can because they were all that well uh, thought out. I really I have nothing negative to say about any of your products. Um, it was very impressive, and I can't wait to go back to, to our friends in Tallahassee and let them know about what I learned today and what Florida schools are doing in our great state. So God bless you all and keep pushing forward. And it has been an honor to be with all of you here today. God bless. Thank you, Senator. Uh, what a speech. Uh, so I believe now the uh, jury is, uh, as come up with their deliberation, and uh, I, they are still deliberating. They are going to come very soon. I can see, I can hear them. They still are hesitating, and I would be like our senator said, I will hesitate myself if I had to choose. Um, here we go. Here comes the jury. Only two of them. One is limping. <laughs> so I, I've asked Michael, can you give the, the summary of your deliberation? They were so intense. We can hear you from the back. All right. I'm joking here. Yeah. I'm going to give the mic to Michael. Michael, can you make it? OK. So first of all, congratulations to all the teams. You did a fantastic job. Uh, I think it's as challenging to sit here as a judge and try and evaluate uh, a three or so minute pitch and to do a good job of providing feedback and everything else. Uh, and so again, we, our consensus feedback is you all did a wonderful job and I trust that you'll continue to focus on uh, moving your companies forward uh, with the good products that you have. So the three top uh, rated uh, teams uh, in the third position is sweet um, and uh, we like the product uh, I have a personal affinity toward it uh, I grew up in Flint Michigan so do I need to say more right we all know what happened there and so having a solution for a, a, such a major problem worldwide uh, is pretty interesting. In the second position, uh, Nexus. Again, we're all excited about the product opportunity that you have, and be, we'd be curious to, to hear a little bit more about your, your plans to really move forward and take it to market. Um, there's definitely some potential there, and so you should explore it even further. And then the first position was Capacitech. <laughs> One of the things that, was, things that was really interesting to me anyway is you know, all the, the work that you've gotten done, the customer support that's there, uh, the fact that it's patented and everything else. I mean, there's just an awful lot of legwork that's been done at such an early stage, and you don't typically see that uh, with student companies. And so 
Uh, a lot of that effort is, is something that I think all of you should take note of because it's the kind of thing that's going to make your company um, the probability of success is going to be much higher. So again, congratulations. You all did a wonderful job and thank you for allowing me to participate. Thank you, Mike. Uh, um, so congratulations to all the teams. I want to thank all the teams for participating. We had uh, 10 universities represented today, uh, 10 universities from Florida. It's so encouraging, so uh, such a, I can't, I can't describe my feelings to see all these students really leading innovation in Florida. So I can only say, that the future is very, very bright. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And I think I look forward to next year at Emerge America to hold similar events, if you like to. But I think, based on FC, we should do it. And thank to, again, all universities which have participated, all the deans which are in the room, who are in the room right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, as a last thank, I would like to uh, give a token of appreciation to the judges uh, to, uh, who have deliberated. And so Bob is going to give you the little token of appreciation. Thank you for being part of the jury. Again, thank you everybody. Thank you. <laughs>